Love that, that new hymn that uh, he rolled out. Thank you, Matt. That was uh, ringing in my mind all weekend. I woke up this morning singing it, so it's kind of cool. I love, I was at a conference one time, and Mike Blake said, Brian, what's your favorite song? I said, I can't remember the title, but it's the one we rolled out two weeks ago. And so uh, that's how I love the way God works like that. So I hope, those, I, hope the, I hope the things that we sing are like anthems. You know, when I was lost, I always had to have a soundtrack going, you know, it was Boston or Van Halen or something. Had to always be rolling. And uh, now that I'm saved, it's like God gives me a new soundtrack. I just love that about him. Now, that has nothing to do with the message, but uh, welcome to HBF. If you have a Bible, uh, be turning to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And if you are a guest, perhaps, or you don't have a Bible, in the seat in front of you in the rack, there should be a Bible that was assembled here at HBF. We'd love for you to open that up and turn to page 903. 903 in, the, uh, in that Bible, you will find the text in which we'll be reading from here in just a moment. And uh, if you would like to take that with you, you're welcome and, uh, to take that and uh, walk out the door with it. That would be our gift to you. And so uh, we are going to continue this morning in our Plugged In Sermon Series as uh, we talk about the need to be plugged in. And uh, it's important because we've been strategically moving through several points necessary to plug into God's perfect will, His complete will. And some of you have noticed that the last couple of sermons, I've directly touched on uh, a couple of the four goals of discipleship. Uh, and so, uh, and some of you are like, what are the four goals of discipleship? Well, uh, don't worry about it. Just listen and follow the Lord. But in addition to plugging into worship, we've, we've, uh, we've also looked at the need to <clears throat> plug into the Word and then plug into fellowship with believers last week. And today we're going to look at our need to plug into the church. And oftentimes people don't understand the distinction between uh, the fellowship of believers, which is obviously integrated with the church, and actually plugging into the church itself. And we'll talk about that this morning. Hopefully, actually for the next two weeks, we're going to be discussing this. So if you're fellowship with believers, th- let me just give you the, the, something you can walk away with, just in case you want to tune me out right now, right, and uh, just go away. You can, you can take this with you out the door already, and I haven't, I haven't even gotten in the text. If your fellowship with believers is not leading you into... A, uh, a relationship, uh, obviously, with the Lord Jesus Christ and establishing you in a local church, then you need to find new, uh, new fellowship. You need to find other believers because those are not healthy spiritual relationships, regardless of the title. And so this, this is a very personal message for me uh, and messages that I'll be bringing in the next couple weeks. Um, and I, I've, obviously, I would never equate myself in any way, shape, or form to the Apostle Paul. I've never persecuted the church or anything of that nature um, or had nearly as dramatic of a, of a salvation experience or, uh, or ministry for that matter. But I can certainly say <clears throat> that um, I was as far away from being an advocate for the local church as anybody that you would ever want to meet um, before I was a Christian. So God's done a tremendous work in my life, uh, not only to have me participate in the local church, uh, but to be so completely convinced of the divine origin and operation of the local church in the world today, uh, that obviously now I'm, I'm all in. And he's completely renewed my mind. He's changed my heart. And uh, obviously now I, I counted one of the, well, not one, of, it is that one of the greatest privileges of my earthly life is to be able to be here and have anything to say from God's word any given Sunday uh, or any given opportunity that God's ever given me, frankly, for that matter, but especially uh, to be one that... Uh, is responsible now for making sure that the local church is um, in shape and healthy and moving forward on God's mission. That's my, that's my responsibility. I don't get extra brownie points in heaven. That's actually what I'm accountable to. Uh, and if I don't do that, I'm going to be in trouble, frankly. Uh, and so uh, I willingly took that on. Why? Because I'm so convinced of what God is doing through the local New Testament church. I'm, I'm convinced that is exactly what he is, is using to accomplish his mission in time. And uh, I would have never been able to preach the message I'm going to preach this morning, uh, or even came close to being a pastor in a local New Testament church, if it wasn't for the local New Testament church. And so, in a world in which we live, I cannot stress the importance of being established in a growing, functional, and functioning, healthy, Bible-believing local church. I, I cannot stress it. Um, because there's a lot of things pulling at you. You need to be in a local New Testament church whether it's this one or another one, but you need to be in one. And when Jesus ascended, he replaced himself with three things. The indwelling Holy Ghost. What else did he replace himself with? You guys know, you guys are the, this is the early service. You are the, 
you guys are in, all right? So what the, 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 local, the, the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, and then, of course, the local New Testament church. Those three things are what repla- Jesus replaced himself with after he ascended in Acts chapter 1. And so as we go through the book of Acts, actually, that's what we see is that transition. It's a transition from his earthly presence to the presence of the body of Christ, the Spirit of God. And then by the end of the first century, the whole canon of Scripture was compiled. And we've been running off of that ever since. And we're going to take that into the clouds as we get caught away. So Ephesians 4, that's our text this morning. And I don't have time to tarry. I got so much I want to say that we're going to just jump into this. Ephesians chapter 4 is a rich passage. It gives us much definition of the supernatural and practical structure uh, in the work of the church. I'm not going to be able to break it all down and expose it. I just want you to read this as the Lord anoints us, and just look at this in the context of what it truly is, as a definition of the local church. Ephesians chapter 4, let's stand in honor of God's word, if you, if you would please, and uh, let's read verse 1 through uh, verse 17. Ephesians 4, 1 through 17, the text says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended is, uh, <clears throat> now he that is, I'm sorry, now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might be, that he might fill all things. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in, into him, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying, which is building, of itself in love. And verse 17 is where we'll close. This I say, therefore, Heartland Baptist Fellowship, and I testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles in the vanity of of their mind. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning thanking you so much for this passage. It, it tells us and takes us from heaven to earth uh, to hell, back up to heaven again, and leaves us with the local New Testament church, its officers, its function. Uh, Lord, it tells us our role. There's so much it's, that's in this passage, in these verses we've just read, uh, that deals with the practical nature of the local New Testament church and us walking here in Christ's stead, reconciling men to God. Lord, I pray today that you would anoint the message that we have from your word. Lord, this is such an important time and topic. Lord, I pray, God, that uh, you would remove me and, uh, Lord, and uh, that the, there would nothing, be nothing here of Brian Hedges. Lord, I pray that you would speak as only you can to your people this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So this chapter is about walking. And uh, you can see that right off the bat. Paul is, is very concerned about the walk of the church in Ephesus. And, and this local church um, is here, no doubt, for a purpose. The church of Ephesus as well as the church at, uh, at uh, Harrisonville, Heartland Baptist Fellowship. And we are to be the hands, the feet, the heart, the mind of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. We're here to get the gospel where it needs to go on time. You hear me say that week in, week out. Now, if you want to grow in Christ, you cannot do it apart from a relationship 
with his body. You're not going to do it outside of his body. You can't be detached from the body of Christ and grow in Christ. And I know that's not popular today, but it's the truth. The local New Testament church is the, is the visible body of Christ. And we'll talk more about that as we go. Now, if you want to glorify God with your life, you're not going to do it outside the fellowship of a local New Testament church. So just start right there, too. That's another takeaway. If you want to glorify God with your life, you will not do it outside the fellowship of a local New Testament church. Now, you don't have to be in this church. There's a lot of churches in the United States because we live in a wonderful country. But you've got to be plugged into a local New Testament church. That's not just a cute sermon title. you really got to be, or your life is not going to be fully glorifying God. Now, I know as I say that, that's going to set with some of you wrong. And that's good, because you need to hear the truth, because God loves you. Now, if we're going to plug into the church, we must understand the definition and the usage of the word and, and, uh, and get to the beginning of it. And the first mention of it is in Matthew chapter 16. Now, I'm not going to go there right away. We'll get there in just a minute. But we've got to have the proper definition, because the word church is only found in the New Testament. And so what is your definition of the church? Before I get to the biblical one in Matthew uh, and uh, all the other occurrences in the New Testament, what's your definition? And I start there on purpose. Why? Because, because many people have their own definition of what church is, even if they won't say it out loud. You know, you may, you may view the church like I used to, right? A, a bunch of used car salesmen who are peddling Jesus to make some money. You know, I, I, didn't, I couldn't, I, I tell you, the first time I went to church, well, the second time I went to church, no, the third time after I went to church, after I was saved, and uh, the first time I saw our, 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 the local church that I actually grew up in and was sent out of, I was absolutely, uh, if it wasn't for the preaching of the Word of God, I'd have walked out the door. Just because I saw television cameras, I saw a dude with a sparkly watch on, I'm just, I, just, I was so ridiculously cynical. Uh, that was, of course, during the time of Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, and some of you don't know about that, praise the Lord. But uh, as far as I was concerned, you know, uh, that was all of them. They are all just a bunch of shysters. And so, of course, that's, not, that's just, a, just a stupid way of thinking, but that's, of course, how shallow I was. Now, now some see church as a great organization, right? It's a great, uh, it's a great club. It's a great, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great organization, and it's a good place to go and get connected. It's a good place to have a relationship. It's a good place to be seen and, uh, and you know, and see others. Because, it's, well, it's advantageous to your place and the community, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it's probably not why you are at HBF, but you'll be at another church typically if that's the way you roll. But there are certain churches that is exactly the way it kind of works in the community. I mean, if you're going to be in the community, if you're going to be a mover shaker at times, it really is good to be part of that club uh, because that's where uh, those folks are. And so, and so it's kind of a social organization. And, then, uh, and so it's not like you've got an ax to grind like I used to, you know, but you just kind of... It's just it's it's useful to suit your purposes, and uh, you'll take it or leave it. Now, um, perhaps you're here today, and you sit compliantly. You're here because someone else really is into this church thing. I mean, they are they're like crazy about it. They're nuts. You know, they're they're ridiculous. Like when I got saved, I remember people saying, "Brian, I, I, this is a great decision you've made, but you know, don't let it you know don't let it get a hold of you. You know, you're getting a little you're getting radical. You know." You know, it's okay. It's a good decision, but don't let it like eclipse your life. Anybody ever have that testimony? Oh yeah, yeah. A lot of people, family members. Uh, hey, you're getting a little crazy with that church thing. Maybe you've joined somebody today. You're here because you're like with one of those crazies. I know how that is. I know how that is. And you think it's really much more about money or or just maybe just perpetuating a myth of an ancient martyr named Jesus, you know, from 2,000 years ago. And you're a little bit, you know, troubled by how all these people are so caught up into this thing. Hey, Jesus was a good guy. It's no doubt he was a historic figure. Nobody in the world with a right mind could even deny that. But you're like thinking, oh, well, he's just, you know, but these people are just like, they got to have a crutch. It's an emotional crutch. And boy, some of these people really need an emotional crutch. So it's okay, I'll sit here with them and I'll enjoy it, but really it's just entertainment or it's just something I need to endure till I can run away from here as fast as I can. And so, I mean, I've been all of those things in my life. I have been into, play, well, except the social status thing, but I've been to the point where, I mean, I just, I had no biblical viewpoint of the local church and I didn't understand what it was all about. And worse yet, I, I, that's okay. If you're not a Christian and, 
I don't really matter. What you think about the church is irrelevant. I mean, uh, to me, but, and, and frankly, you're free to think what you want to think. But the, the, but the reality is, is that there are Christians that share some of the views I just had. Christians. And it grieves me at my core. It grieves me deeply. And I've really never had a, a platform to really even share uh, my whole view on all of this, and that's why it's going to take me a couple weeks. <laughs> but, but the reality is just that, man, uh, Christians are the last people in the world that should have a dim view of the church. If you say that you're born again, I mean, we are here in the, we are here. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. He was born again, or he was born again. He, he resurrected on the third day, and now we're, we're alive. We're born again. Praise the Lord, but, but we can't live that out without the local church. I mean, what, are we, what, what in the world is going on in a Christian's mind when they get so cynical against a local church that they disparage her in public? Man, it hurts my heart. And it hurts my heart because I was once like that. I was once an idiot stick. And I was so cynical. A perpetual stream of cynicism about the church. You know how long this has been that I've noticed it in Christian authors, Christian books, Christian literature, about as long as we've been a church. I guess before I got saved, I didn't notice it. Or before I got saved, I didn't notice it. Before, I became, before we planted the church, let me be clear, I was saved long before we planted the church. Okay, so, uh, so before we planted the church, I really didn't notice the cynicism in the culture. Uh, I, the lost culture, yes, because I was part of that. I was totally tuned into that. I get it. But I never like, felt like I needed to go on an apology tour for ch- the church. I didn't care what kind of music or how they dress. It didn't matter to me. I got saved. I was, like I just said earlier, I was listening to Van Halen one day. I roll in the church. I'm singing hymns the next. It was not a big deal to me. Why? Because Jesus saved my soul. That was the last, least of my concerns. Oh, put on a tie. I'll put on a tie. I had to learn how to tie it. But anyway, I just did whatever because that was not the issue. It didn't like get up under my skirt and cause me to write a book about how irrelevant we are to the culture. Why? Because when I went to church, listen, beloved, Jesus was there. And the word of God was being preached. And Jesus Christ changed my life. And so we're here at HBF and we're like, man, what, what battle can we fight? What real battle? What is the church not getting done? I'm talking about sinning, right? So I'm right there. What's the church not doing? I read books on building bridges, this, that, and the other. And that's not in the Bible, by the way. Anyway, and so I said, let's find something that's, just, that's impossible that will make a statement that Jesus Christ is here and he's changing lives. So we, we got opened a door um, and he opened it. It was closed initially, but... He opened a door to the jail. And because Christians had abused their liberty in the jail, we did not have liberty in the jail. (laughs) And so I had to go with other uh, local church pastors, literally as a team. People that are not, uh, you know, they do believe Jesus. They believe the gospel, but I mean, they're not exactly lined up with us doctrinally, if you know what I'm saying. So we don't have the same exact views. But you know, it wasn't those issues of the doctrine that was the biggest problem for me is when we roll into maximum security or medium security or whatever. And, and, and a minister of the gospel is just making all kinds of excuses for the church. Starting off the gospel presentation, which I know the church sucks. I know the church hasn't met your needs. Now, I'm sure in his life that must be the case because that's how he started every conversation. And I'm sorry for that. But I would come right behind him <laughs> and say, Listen, guys, Jesus Christ saved my soul. And if it wasn't for God training me up in a local New Testament church, I wouldn't be in the jail today. I mean, Jesus Christ is, man, he's everything. And it just grieved me that, that, that here these guys are, I mean, up to sin over their heads, they're, they're bound by sin and wickedness. We're in here talking about petty issues within a local New Testament church context instead of the real issues of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, it, just, it just bothers me. It still bothers me. So, beloved, I understand God is not always pleased with the churches. I know that. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you all those stories. I could tell you stories of why I could be offended and not be in the church. 
I've got as long a list as anybody in the room. But it, for some reason, the Spirit of God has, has just taken care of all of that. Because I really believe that Jesus Christ is working through you, through his word, that we are the real deal. We're the authentic, Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, Word of God preaching, God-ordained local New Testament church. And I'm not talking about Heartland so much, but in my formative years, when the preacher didn't, didn't know, just a little, I was thinking about that. When I, I sent, we sent an invitation to our wedding, the preacher never got it until after the wedding. He didn't invite the, the people we were, you know, they always got up and said, hey, so-and-so's getting married. It never happened. So we go to the wedding, you know, and then the pastor comes up, man, Brian, that was in my mailbox. I'm so sorry. You guys, I never even thought about being offended. It didn't even occur to me. It didn't occur to me to leave the church. It didn't occur to me to even get mad. Why? Well, because I was getting fed. I owed that preacher so much. I, I felt like I owed him my life because if it wasn't for him preaching the word week in, week out, week in, week out, you can miss my wedding, but preach the word of God. I mean, that's, that's where I was at. And that's praise to God. I hope that's still where I'm at. I mean, the priorities have to be there. They have to be what they really are because we're in a, a supernatural warfare. So I've read Revelation 2 and 3. Is Jesus always happy with the church? Oh, no. <laughs> Is he always happy with you? No. Things aren't always right. They're not always good. But God still loves us. He still died for us. So before we get high and mighty and pile on with criticism of the churches, we need to decide if we're going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. And so, so why am I so passionate about this? Well, with all due respect to my deceased father, I was taught from the time I was a little kid um, that, you know, church, in essence, was a joke, and that, and that uh, the word doctrine was always a, a bad word. Now, why was that? Well, because my own earthly father was mistreated by a Baptist church. He got saved at a revival meeting, zealous in the Lord, my aunt confirmed this. She said, oh, he's come by the house every day after work, Bible study with me. He was always asking questions. So what happened? I'm like, I never knew that man. What happened? Oh, well, he told me what happened before he died. I, I asked him, I said, Dad, what happened? He just told me the truth. He says, Brian, all they ever wanted from me was my work. They had me driving the bus to Youth for Christ, driving here, driving there. Me and your grandpa, my, my grandpa, built the whole wing on the new church building. And uh, that's all they cared about. And when I couldn't get there to pick up the kids, they just told me, well, then, no, then they're not going to get picked up, and they laid a guilt trip on me. Now, no doubt, he probably loves sin, and he chose to have an excuse not to be there eventually. But I, I, know, I know my dad, and, and I know he was sincere in his commitment while he had it. So he got burnt. Is that good? No. Does that mean we need to have angst? No. Does it happen? Yeah, it did happen. And so, that's the fact of the matter. So, I, I heard stories, right, of other things. The hypocrisy of the preacher having a case of beer in the trunk of his car. Um, I myself would drive by then and see the, the deacons, you know, with their Paul Malls out at the front of the church door every week. And just added and added to the, what I was just building up in my own mind. I kind of got, I got discipled a little bit in that. And my dad would always say, Brian, all those churches just have their doctrine. They just have their teaching as if it was irrelevant. I didn't know what the word doctrine meant. To me, it was just this bad cuss word. It's like, doctrine! Oh my gosh, it's bad. So you can imagine what happened when I came to the local New Testament church and the thing they're up there proclaiming is, we got to have right doctrine! It's like, what am? And of course, while he was at work learning from a Jehovah Witness or being deceived by one, his son was just going further and further away from anything that would resemble a local New Testament church. And so to complicate it further, I rarely met a Christian at school who was serious about faith in Christ. I always got to give props to my aunt, my Aunt Joyce, man. True blue, always going to church. Same church, same church my dad didn't like. And she, when I would go, she took me when I was a little kid. She'd come by the house. Mom and dad wouldn't go, but Aunt Joyce took me. 
until I got too caught up in the world to go with her anymore. I couldn't take it. I got so convicted I'd stand outside the church, and the preaching wasn't even good. I'd stand outside the church, and that was it. So I, I, I didn't know what was going on, but my heart was so convicted, I didn't even want to go in the church for the main service. I ended up skipping out. But she was always faithful. She still is to this day, by the way. She's a wonderful woman. And so you see, you see the devil is at work all the time. And of course it centers around the local New Testament church. And so like I said, to complicate it further, when I went to school and attended parties and other things, uh, you go, who was there? You, you young people, you tell me. No, you're going to the parties, you better not be. I'm not really kidding. But who was there at the parties? Well, the Christians. The ones that said they were Christians. The ones that were in the youth group. Whatever youth group that was. The ones that looked pretty squeaky clean. The ones I kind of respected. But you know what? Then I find out, well, they're over here dabbling in the booze and the drugs and the fornication. I mean, heck, they're doing things I'm scared to do. So what does that do? It just says, well, it just reinforces, reinforces what I already was taught. If you'd asked me back in the day, I'd have said that, you know, a local New Testament church, what a joke. So three months before I was born again, Despite all of that, I knew God was calling me. I, knew, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that God was convicting me. What I was doing wasn't working. And circumstances came to pass that everything I poured my life into was just nothing, vanity. And I told Amy, who I was dating at the time, I said, Amy, uh, God is trying to talk to me. So for all of that background, do you understand? Where's the first place I went? You guessed it, the local New Testament church. The same one that hurt my dad, the same one that my aunt was faithful to. And it was unfortunate that that day uh, they were preaching on missions. And I've since met the, I I love the pastor, but I was an idiot, I was lost. And and I know what he was trying to do. He He was trying to move the congregation, but at that time I didn't understand it. So he's doing faith promise. And he's trying to get the congregation stirred up on missions. Which, ironically, of course, now I'm a huge proponent of missions. That's the, that's the mission of God. So, uh, so I'm sitting there listening to this, and I'm like, uh, he says this statement. He says, if you don't make a commitment, you're turning your back on God. I'm sitting there going, heresy. I didn't know the word heresy. But I'm like, well, I can't tell you what I was saying. <laughs> so that's baloney. That's what I'm thinking. Sandwich. And, uh, and so... I'm like, I literally, I get up, you know, it's over. I look at Amy. I remember saying this to her. So I can tell you right now, Amy, God doesn't need my money. And that was true. God was after what? My heart. He wanted me. That was a true statement. But, so as I walk out the door, I remember walking down those steps. I said, that's it. I'm going to become a Catholic. And because uh, now I, I'm just going to go drink, do what I want to do, and get religious. I think that's what God wants me to do. I was sincere. I'm not making a joke about that. I was serious as a heart attack. Like, that's a good route. My other family's Catholic. I'm done with these Baptist people. I'm out. And, uh, and that was where I was at. And three months later, God met me where I was at. And I got saved at a, at a public school on the floor of a drafting room, kneeling down, asking Christ to come to my heart, receiving the gift of eternal life. That's all credit to God, not because of me. But again, when I say I'm the last person <laughs> that would be the advocate for the local church, I am the last person that would be the advocate for the local church. And I'm telling you today, beloved, the local church is the only way to go. It is the only way to go. So if you're here this morning and you have an attitude with church, you might well bear with me for at least today. Because I would pray that you could find no more committed advocate for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ than me. Now, I know I'm not the most committed, but I pray that I would be. I pray that I'd be the most committed that I could ever be to the Lord and His church. Why? Because He's worthy of it. And His church is worthy of it regardless of what they do. Because He bought them. He paid for them. He loves them, so I love them. So let's look at the Bible definition of church now. That's all just my testimony a little bit. And uh, we need to move along. So... 
Enough about my definition. What's the Bible say about this subject of the local church? The word church is, is used in the New Testament, is only used in the New Testament, in it, in it, in it, uh, unless you count Matthew 16, 18, and 18, 17 as Old Testament because they were uh, you know, written and spoken prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So in, in context, historically, that was Old Testament um, time. Uh, but, of course, it's included in our Bibles as the New Testament. So, uh, as a whole, the, the word is used 116 times in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament. And, of course, it's only used in the New Testament. It starts there in Matthew 16, 18. It ends in Revelation 3, 14, which is the, the Laodicean church, the one in which we are today. The word is always used as church or churches, with the exception of three places where it's translated in Acts 19 as assembly. And the reason it's translated assembly in those places is because that assembly was called to persecute or to judge uh, unjustly uh, Christians. So it's not called a church there. It's called an assembly. You can go check that out on your own. The word church is, is a word from the Greek translated from the word ekklesia. Ekklesia means called out, You're called or herald, herald out, ekklesia. The Spanish word iglesia is a similar word. So the word church defines itself by its meaning and scope and, and deep, it's deep and rich as we explore its application through the Bible. Again, there's 116 mentions, so I can't exhaust it even in, a, in two sermons. But the church is call, a called out assembly of born-again believers who identify with Christ, his doctrine, and his ordinances. So you're like, okay, Brian, that sounds good. And that's really what the church is. Now, what it isn't. It's not a business, though there's business that goes on. It's, it's not a, an experience, though people have great experiences at church. It's not a TV program, though at times churches have outreaches on TV. The church is not a campus ministry like Navigators, Campus Crusade, or InterVarsity, uh, although those have strategic and good uses. The church is not a woman's shelter, or a homeless shelter, or a woman's clinic, though those organizations are very useful in communities and and God does use those. The church is certainly not a concert hall full of Christian music or taking a headshot of some dude on screen giving a talk. That is not the church. Uh, the church is not an event or even an activity. There are many aspects of all these, but, but all of that happens in conjunction with the work of the church. But they themselves do not constitute church. So I want to give you four Ds if you're a note taker. Let me give you the four Ds that help us understand the distinctions of a biblical local New, local New Testament church. And then after I give you the distri- distinctions, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about a parachurch as time permits. So, number one, doctrine. Your first D is doctrine. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. First Timothy 3.15, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10.17. So God has not only promised to build his church, but he has preserved us until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll be here until we're caught up, and then we'll come back with him at the second coming. And that's all promised through the power of God's word, and it's ensured through the word of God himself. So we, the church, not the publishing houses, are, are not in it for the money, right? Uh, we're not making new Bible translations, so we can make bucks. We are here to steward the Word of God, and we try to do that here at HBF literally in every way. That includes teaching the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, and now assembling the Word of God and making sure we can get our hands on the Word of God. And so that's what we do as a church. It is the church's responsibility to, to, write, to have right teaching and right preaching of God's Word. It is the church's responsibility to rightly divide the Word and reproduce faithful disciples and churches who can do likewise, according to 2 Timothy 2.15. So number one D is doctrine. Number two is delineation. Uh, there are two ordinances trusted uh, to the church, right? Uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. You hear me say that all the time. So the church delineates its membership, its members, by the ordinances that Jesus has given us. He has entrusted those to us the church to steward. So baptism is the first act of obedience for those who are saved, and they become and and they it identifies them as as the the reality that they are already members of the body of Christ because they, they have received Christ. So we receive them uh, publicly in our membership when they publicly identify with Him through baptism. We'll do that in the next service, and uh, we'll see that in action. And so to be members of of His body naturally implies you would want to you would want and need to identify with the visible body of called out believers. What is it to join Christ or to become one with Christ and not identify with his visible body? Makes no sense. And so it delineates us from this world. And so if you are willing to identify with Christ publicly as a sinner that's been saved by grace through faith, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood, his death, his burial, his resurrection, then we should be willing to identify 
uh, with you as a member when you stand up and show us that in the baptism tank. And that's revealed to the local New Testament church. And then as often as you do it, what do we do? We celebrate that. We identify with Christ and his sufferings and his shed blood and, and the body and with one another. We do that through the, uh, the ordinance of the, of the Lord's Supper. And we do that perpetually as, we, as we've been called to do by the Lord Jesus Christ as often as we do it. So the first D is doctrine. The second D is delineation. There is a difference between us and the world. And Jesus Christ has, has set us apart for his use. He has called us out as an assembly to represent We're here to represent him. The third is discipleship. We gather to scatter. There's no doubt about it. We are here. The mission is to make disciples of all nations. That's what we do. And so uh, we gather to scatter. So so the bottom line is, is we are here to equip. We do you no favors as a church if we do not have everything available to help equip you. Now, all we need is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Amen. But God has given us an ability to structure the church, to meet things where they're at, to have here Discipleship 1, Discipleship 2, uh, HBI, in addition to the other things that are really necessary, which is exercising in ministry and doing the things that God's called us to do as we learn the Word of God, as we live it out, and then we learn to love it, and we give ourselves sacrificially in service. Man, those are the things that just turn God on. And God blesses His church, and there's fruit, man. It's all about discipleship, reproducing faithful men, faithful women, reproducing faithful families, reproducing faithful New Testament local churches. That's what we do, okay? Number three, four, is discipline. We're also separated under the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're called to be holy as Christ is holy, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And so we not only use our liberty, or I'm sorry, we're not to use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love we're to serve one another, is what Galatians 5, 13 says. And so we are to be disciplined in the way we behave ourselves, that we are to be disciplined in our love for one another. One of the things that is evident in the church is that we have a supernatural love for one another. We are, not, uh, we are not to use our liberty for an occasion to the flesh. We're to use it for love. As Steve Fleshman likes to say, God loves us enough to meet us where we're at, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. And so while there is great grace and liberty in growing uh, to the place uh, that our p- position in heaven uh, matches our practice on earth, there are times when willing disobedience brings discipline from the body of Christ through separation for the sake of the gospel. What am I saying? So you have all kinds of liberty to grow and go. But the reality is, too, we have a biblical standard here. And a Christian is supposed to act like a Christian. That's defined in the Bible. I'm not going to get into the the weeds on that this morning. But there are times when we have to say, I'm sorry, Uh, you say that you identify with Christ, but in works you deny him. And so if you will not repent of that, I'm sorry, we're going to have to ask you not to be here anymore. Because uh, it's hurting the cause of Christ. We're the body of Christ. That's hard for people to swallow in this age. But we, from time to time, at HBF have to do that. What I've found, though, most of the time, people who get in, in the, and we don't wish anybody to not be in fellowship with the church, by the way. Uh, we don't do that to punish them. We actually are just recognizing God's punishment upon them. When that happens, it's, it's basically saying, guys, we've done everything we can do, and now you're in God's hands. And we pray God's mercy upon you. And when he's done, come back home, right? Confess it and forsake it. And we'll, we'll bring you back in. We always want reconciliation. But sometimes we have to say, sorry, uh, you can get spanked outside the, the church house, uh, not inside, because we're not going to glory in your shame. Uh, and so don't be bringing that whatever in here. You need to take that out. Okay, another way to see the four Ds is the four Ps. And I'll run those by you real quick. Number one, just simplify this down. The same exact thing I just said, but just a little bit different. Number one, our responsibility is to preach pure doctrine. Preach pure doctrine. So the four Ds were doctrine, delineation, discipleship, and discipline. The four Ps are preaching pure doctrine. And then the picture of Christ in the church is revealed through those ordinances. The practice of multiplication of discipleship and the purity of of sanctification of the body parts. Preaching pure doctrine, the picture of Christ in the church, the practice of multiplication of discipleship and purity of a sanctified body and its parts. Okay, so um, I want to change gears on you and turn you to Matthew 16, 18. Go to Matthew 16, 18. This is the first time you see the word church mentioned in the Bible. One of my favorite passages I was actually going to start here, but I chose instead to start in Ephesians 4, squarely in a doctrinal passage that we could bounce off of. <clears throat> here Jesus is speaking with <clears throat> his disciples. and and 
course, they acknowledge that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, in verse 16. And Jesus is, blessed art thou, Joan, uh, uh, Simon, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. Then he says this statement. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and his name means rock. Upon this rock, which is small, small r, notice, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Roman Catholic Church takes that to mean that Peter is the first pope. That's not in the Bible at all. It's not even what he's talking about. And I would actually ask you not to focus on that for a moment, but to look at what the text says. Uh, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, who will build my church? I will build my church. Jesus Christ is the one building his church. He is building the body of Christ. That's what's so important about Ephesians chapter 4. We are a body. Ephesians tells us that we're fitly joined and we're fitly framed. And we edify, we build one another in love. That's why I chose that passage. But it started with Jesus Christ. This is the first mention of the word church. Who's going to build it? Jesus Christ is going to build his church. He's building his church. And I want to mention this, not to beat up on Roman Catholics because of my own testimony. Um, I was, for the time I was interested in being a Roman Catholic, and I, just in case you're here this morning and you're wondering about all this church stuff, I mean, where'd you guys come from? Um, you know, out east where my wife is from, being a Baptist is like a byword. I mean, it's like, those guys are crazy. You know, they might as well handle snakes or something. And so uh, what is up with, the, with this Bible-believing local church stuff? Uh, when I was lost, I was ignorant of church history, and, and I just believed by osmosis. I don't even know how I come to this understanding, but I just believed that Peter was the first pope and that the Roman Catholic Church was the oldest church. It had been around forever. It had been around since Jesus. And so when I walked out of that Baptist church, it just I'm like, well, I'm going to go to the real thing, the authentic church. That was the way I was thinking. I can't tell you how I thought that. I do not know how that heresy <laughs> came to my mind. I don't know how I, I knew that. Uh, but that's what I thought. And I wasn't even schooled that way. Um, that's just where I was at. I thought it was the original. Uh, and it was only the grace of God that I didn't hooked up, get hooked up in her wine. It was only God's good providence in my own life. And so this passage in Matthew 16, 18, it's a key. It's a key to the Roman church. Because they use this passage to prove that Peter was the first pope. Which, of course, that's hogwash. Uh, there have been pagan pontiff, pontiff Maximuses since 254 B.C., when, when the, the office and its officers, the, the, car, the College of Cardinals, was transferred from Pergamos. And so, uh, which then was, by, by the way, a transfer from Babylon. Literally, the priesthood of the Babylon religion got transferred to Pergamos, and then it got transferred to Rome in 254 B.C. The Pontifus Maximus, it was, it was the elite leader uh, of that sect for hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And so that system was in place, that pagan system, for hundreds of years. But of course, uh, we know, and this is not like secret. You can study this stuff. That's why I'm wondering, how did I come up with this crazy thought? We know that in 312, uh, Constantine, under the sign of the cross, you know, he has this vision at a bridge, and now he's, quote, a Christian. So at the point of a sword, you're going to be a Christian too. And, he's, and he then, of course, under the name of Christ, starts conquering everybody and expanding the Roman Empire. And so... Uh, he is now friendly to Christians, so Christians are like, cool, right? Uh, as long as you go with him, he's friendly. But there's no evidence that Constantine was ever really a born-again Bible-believing Christian. Not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, he was just as pagan the day he died as the day he decided that he was going to be a Christian. And so, and so those are just the facts of history. In 380 AD, the pagan Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire. And, of course, that empire goes on today, just like Daniel said. It would because that's what the Bible has t taught us. And so, um, and so that's important because Peter was no more the first pope than I'm the Michelin man, right? It's just, it's just not, it's not true. It's just hogwash. So uh, if you think the current Jesuit bouncer from Argentina is the vicarious representative of Christ on earth, I say this with all love, but you are deceived. If you're biblically born again, you are representing Christ on earth. You are his ambassador, you are here to reconcile people to God. You, that's on the authority of Scripture. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so I only point this out because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that to this day, if you're not part of Rome, you're not part of the church. 
So this church then, therefore, this church, Heartland Baptist Fellowship, is illegitimate because I, we will not, I will not, but we will not recognize the authority of anybody other than Jesus Christ over his church because he's the one building it. It's not based on a succession of popes or even a succession of preachers. Preachers don't own the church. Jesus Christ owns the church. It's his church. He purchased us with his own blood. It's his church. And so it's important because, because you don't care much about that today in America. You know why? Because you don't have to. Because 240 years ago, people bled out and died all over the place, and they ran off the Brits, and with that went away the, the influence, or most of the influence, of the monarchies, right? And the European influence uh, that controlled the government. And of course, so in this country, from that, from that point forward, uh, began this new process of freedom of religion apart from the government. And so here we are today. We can worship as we please. You can worship a goat if you please. It doesn't really, I mean, this country, it really is based, as the founders understood, on your moral bearings. And we've been given liberty, so we didn't have to worry about that. We didn't have to die like many of our brothers throughout church history uh, because we did not believe in this or that particular doctrine of the Roman church. Now, some of the best people, just so you understand, I, I love Catholics. Many people in this church today were born Roman Catholic. Some of them went through adult catechism. Uh, so I'm not saying I hate Catholics. My relatives, some of them are Catholics. Some of the best people I know are Catholics. Some of the best people I've ever seen in church history are Catholics. Jonathan Huss, man, he's my favorite. One of my favorites in the Bible, Roman Catholic. Of course, he did die at the hands of Rome. But the point being is that, that he was a good man. He, got, he was born again. There's a lot of great people in the Catholic Church. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about the doctrine, the teaching, and the deception. And I do want to be clear that I have no problems with, with Catholic people, uh, even if the, if the Pope wanted to, you know, well, I don't know about that. Anyway, so we, have, we, we don't want to do anything with that, but we, we have many members in the church who are born again that were once in a religion called the Roman Catholic Church. And this church is about a relationship. Some of the greatest saints of the Reformation, came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And so I just want you to understand that when Jesus comes for his church, he will gather saints from the four corners of the earth. And when he does that, he's not going to check the membership of the local New Testament church. You know what he's going to check? If your soul is sealed to the day of redemption. Have you been biblically born again? You see, to be in the, a member of the church, you better be a member of Christ. Not just saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, sign on the dotted line, now I'm a member of Heartland, I must be a Christian. That's no different than the Roman Catholic Church. If you believe the church is what saves you, you're misled. It's Jesus Christ alone and his shed blood that saves you. We just identify that and celebrate it every week. It is Jesus Christ who saves you. And so it's important that we understand that. He's not gonna, when Jesus returns for his church, he's not going to drop in on Rome and consult the Pope and the College of Cardinals. Okay, who should I let in? You're the universal church. Not at all. He's going to bypass them. As a matter of fact, he's going to let them keep rolling. He's got a purpose for them. But he's going to collect those up that have been biblically born again, that have trusted him as Lord and Savior. And so today you have, so you have that ancient definition of the church, which is complete heresy. And then you have the contemporary definition of the church, which is, which is kind of lunacy. Today among contemporary Christianity, we must uh, be careful not to get caught up in what feels good and forsake the, the Bible itself. I read a book in 2005 by George Barnum, and it fired me up. It's called Revolution. And it, it, took the, it took the view that the church is, well, it's wherever you want it to be. I mean, if it's on the golf course on Sunday, it's much more effective. Why? Because the church is out of date. So the church is wherever you say it is. It's wherever you want it to be. You can just have it your way, man. It's just like Burger King. Do what you want to do. And man, that fired me up. Now David Kinnaman is, is over, running, pretty much writing most of the stuff at Barna, so it's gotten better. But I mean, that Christianity is a potpourri of self-serving saints having their community their way. You know what that really is? It's Revelation 3.20. That's Jesus standing at the door knocking. Hey guys, I want in, but all you want to do is gather over here the way you want to do it. Your little home group, your little this, your little that. And God's like, no, I work through the ordained institution of the local New Testament church. Man, I've seen many a went one that wasn't a sent one. That never works out. People that get their, their panties in a bunch and they get all mad at the local church and they run away and they start their own thing. They're the guru of their new group. You know where that always ends? <laughs> Down the toilet. Or even a, a cult that's, you know, tenfold the 
cult they came out of. And so that's not how we roll in the Bible. God can minister to you through a small group Bible study or a Christian concert. Man, I was at a Stephen Curtis Chapman concert one time. Brother, and I'm telling you, I was deeply moved. I'm like, I'm mad. I'm like, there needs to be an altar call right now. I mean, it was awesome. It was real. I mean, it was genuine. It was the story of, uh, of uh, Steve Saint and all that. It was just beautiful. I got to hear the testimonies. Deeply moved. Deeply authentic. It's still not church. Was it profitable? Yeah. Was it awesome? Yeah. Do I love it? Yeah. Did it, did it encourage me? Yes. It's not the local New Testament church. While some parachurches are really very good, and some is, are very bad, the reality, the reality is that we don't live with the people of, at the concert, right? You feel good at the concert hall, but you don't go home with them. You don't live with them day in and day out. That's the, no, that's the folks that you come here to live with, that you rub elbows with. It's like a family. It, it, it's relationships that have to be worked on. They have the need the, the lubricant of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God and His Word to make them work. It's easy to go to a concert hall or a conference and feel really good about the body of Christ and say, oh, this is the way the body of Christ ought to be. You know what? Uh, the bo- that's not the body of Christ. That's a bunch of Christians, hopefully, if they're saved, gathering together and, and uh, having a good time. And maybe it's edifying, but it's not the work of the church in its entirety. It's not the role that God has in the local New Testament church. If you had to be the church with all of those folks at the Christian conference, all of a sudden your warm, fuzzy feelings would go away. And you'd be ready to come back home to mama. (laughs) I've got news for you. Because it, it just is not what you think it might be. So entertainment, listen, is not ministry sacrifice. That happens within the context of the ministry of the local New Testament church, which is why I prefer small groups to operate around active ministry groups. People who are engaged in the Word of God, doing the mission of God the way God's designed it, that's, that's, where, the, that's where the fruit's going to be. Okay, so let me give you some distinctions here because I'm over time. Number one, or not number one, I'll get to that in a minute, but the distinction between the local church and parachurch because we live in a world where it's confusing. Uh, it's confusing. You know, well, Brian, I mean, it's possible you're hearing me right now and you're just for the first time going, wow. That's not local church. What is the local church? Local church has a priority? Well, if that's the case, then then I want you to to know there's the distinctions because this really helped me out. I would not be here today if it wasn't for this understanding between the local church and the parachurch. Uh, Many years ago, I was uh, was ministering in a parachurch. I spent a lot of years ministering in a parachurch myself. Very profitable, very edifying, um, lots of fruit from it. So I'm not against that. If anyone says, comes out here saying, Brian's against parachurch, you're wrong. I just served on the board of a parachurch for several years here in Harrisonville. We support certain parachurches out of Heartland. We've got a ministry, Life Issues. is all, it's a semi-parachurch right out of, our, out of our church. So I'm not saying that. But you do need to understand the distinction because it's very important. So I'm at this breakfast, this prayer breakfast, and all these pastors come in which was kind of cool because I wasn't really a pastor, but our, our pastor delegated the authority, so he sent me. So I'm sitting here with all these pastors looking around. And, uh, and uh, this friend of mine, he's, a, he's an awesome black minister. I let, this guy could get up and just sing Amazing Grace. Just boom, he could just sing. He was awesome. That has nothing to do with the message. But anyway, so he gets up and he's delivering a, a, a charge and a prayer. And in the process of all this, he says, uh, we're all gathered here together, you know. And he's talking and he's saying, we're two or three are gathered. You know, there am I also true we are the church we are the we are the church when we're here right now and i saw the the director i saw it on his face and he gets up after after all that and he makes it very clear in front of everybody he goes we're, we're not the the church but we are an arm of the church and so on so everything goes to this spiel and i caught it i noticed it i was watching it because when that was said i was like it didn't set well with my soul because i'm like we're the church and I'm, this very thing I'm just talking to you about, it's all good, we're having a good time, we're doing ministry, but our, there's something different about what we're doing here at this parachurch operation than what we're doing back here at my home church. It's different. What is it? So on the way home, I'm driving home. I, remember, I can actually remember on I-70. It's like when you mow the lawn and God talks to you. I don't know about you. I got these moments where I just know God's talking to me. I'm driving home talking to the Lord about this. I'm like, Lord, what is troubling me about this? 
Why is it that I intuitively know this is not a local church? And that just because we gather in the name of Christ, it doesn't constitute the same thing as what I get every Sunday and throughout the week in my local church. And he says, well, Brian, I'm glad you asked. And he says, well, number one, there's no pastors there that are stewarding that organization. There's a director. There's a staff. But it's not a pastor-led organization. Oh, yeah, that's right. The guy that runs it he was an ordained minister, but it's not a church. There's no deacons. No deacons in that organization. They don't observe the Lord's Supper. They don't baptize anybody at that place. Oh, that's the difference. Now you think, well, Brian, that's awful simple. I'll tell you what, awful simple changed the course of my life. Because it was upon that realization. Now, I'd heard this kind of stuff preached myself. But it was upon that realization that I realized and recognized one of the faults of our ministry from the local church. We could not afford to treat that organization as if it was a local church. And if we wanted to see any fruit come from that ministry, guess what we had to do? We had to get them from that great local, that great parachurch organization to a local church where they could get everything they needed. That ministry was like a hospital. The church was home. There was a big difference between a mass unit at the front lines and home. And they weren't going to get the same things there. They were going to get patched up. They were going to get the gospel. They might get saved. But they needed what the church had to offer. They needed the blood. They needed the the heartbeat. They needed the nutrition that comes from being part of the body of Christ. Beloved, when I realized that and we structured the ministry like that, and then we began getting people plugged in local church, guess what we started to see? Fruit. Not just people getting saved. I'm talking about people growing in Christ. People's lives changing. Why? Because of the local New Testament church. And so despite having the best times of my life in that parachurch organization, and I tell you, beloved, I had some great times there. God said, Brian, you know where you should go with your calling. I'm like, yes, sir, the local New Testament church. Is there anything wrong with being the director of a mission somewhere? No. That's great, if that's what God calls you to do. But I'm like, Lord, if I'm going to invest my life, the rest of my life doing something for you, man, I want it to be involved as deep as possible with the local New Testament church. Because this is your, it's not an organization, this is your organism. And next week when you come back, I'm going to talk to you more about that. But let me give you three quick things that are distinct. The local church has a biblical mandate. A parachurch doesn't have a biblical mandate. A a local church is commanded to reach all. I mean, all. We don't have any limits. As a matter of fact, we've got to reach all. A parachurch has a targeted scope. A local church, the promise of Matthew 16, 18, is that we are built and we are sustained by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And a parachurch, they can fulfill their purpose, which is typically evangelistic, But at length, if they fail, they're not accountable at the judgment seat of Christ like we are. Because they're not in there. And so there's a distinction. Now next week, if you come back, I want you to I want you to be ready to hear more from the Word. I'm gonna get a lot deeper in the Word and talk about God's divine design. And then in particular, your particular responsibility and function in the local New Testament church. So I hope you come back. And hear that. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord.